Yeah, in terms of the APB story and the story that um, is being told around Agent Orange, uh, I think one of the things that's been um, a real wake-up call for me is how many families have actually been involved in this horrific disaster and the trauma that it's caused on multiple families, but not just multiple families, but intergenerational destruction of human lives. And so um, my brother Terry Hunter was involved in the APB story, he was a very close friend and family member of all of the work crew and um, yeah, did lots of work with, with uh, Cyril on the river. And um, really amazing to hear how all of this has actually resulted in the loss of what we thought were just taking out a, a group of men um, for a certain period of time. But when you sort of look back and reflect on that terrible loss to family and community, what we've seen is that children have grown up not knowing their father. Mothers have lost their sons. Brothers have lost brothers. And it's an absolutely, it's an absolute, it's an absolute disgrace that the government has actually walked away from this. It's a, a real crime against humanity and I believe it is a real serious case of genocide because what's occurred is that it seems as if there was possible intent in regards to how this extremely destructive poison was brought onto Aboriginal people, onto Aboriginal land. And um, what's extremely sad about this, the situation is that I live on the Fitzroy River and um, visit country quite often and that uh, Ngurra Burr is still very much alive and well and many of our men are, are not. And so it's a, it's a, as I say, it's, um, it's a real hard situation to hear how all of this occurred. So my older brother Ernie Hunter was involved and was really made some serious inquiries and investigation and try to track this story over a long period of time um, because, as I said earlier, we, we'd lost our younger brother. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of think, you know, um, as someone who uh, is trained in public health, why was there no serious um, epidemiological inquiry in terms of how this poison um, was brought to the region and how it was left uh, a story was left unattended and yet when we look at the evidence that um, the inquirers are demonstrating is that this is a story that started in investigation, started to be investigated in the early 80s and here we are 2018 and the families and the people who have died still do not have a resolution on this. One of the things that made our family quite concerned about this matter was that we were told that when, our, when my brother was buried um, that they kept his vital organs with, with the hospital, St. Jo St. Uh, Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. So I kind of think if there was a reason to do that, then there must have been some thinking in the mind of government about how these vital organs um, could be used in some sort of situation to either uh, build a case of truth or try and debunk that. So, um, yeah, from my perspective, as I said, you know, like, it's just been an extremely painful process to watch, but I kind of figure from my perspective is that these men must not die in vain and the torture that's come through intergenerationally in terms of the cancer clusters and having seen the mutations that have been caused by this sort of destruction, it's a real crime against humanity and the government must be held accountable for these acts. Yeah, look, I, I think the United Nations is a uh, important mechanism for having people's story told and for nation states to be made um, or put under scrutiny in terms of impacts on uh, genocide and impacts on ecocide. But the stories that I've seen go to the United Nation does not really give me that much hope because we've had clear cases where Australia has breached its own uh, internal laws, let alone international laws, and there's been no uh, recount in terms of how are they meant to uh, be accountable for justice. 
So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's difficult for me to sort of imagine that because, as I said, a lot of the situations which are nowhere near this level of, um, to some extent, intent um, has, from my understanding, seen a satisfactory outcome. But um, I think one of the things is that um, how do we as Aboriginal people who are impacted and inflicted by these sorts of things, how do we bring our story in terms of being a witness to account and taking it to an international level? Because there are international laws and international covenants that Australia should abide by. It's just, um, as I said, this, the stories that I've seen go to the UN with considerable evidence have not uh, resulted in any satisfactory outcome from my perspective. And so I, I think it's important for people to tell the story and to put it on the public record. But it seems to me that um, Australia has, a, has not at any moment in time in our history been made accountable uh, to account for, just, for the injustices that have occurred to Indigenous people. I think the process that you're engaging um, is very is critical in terms of seeking justice because one of the ways of storytelling is to use film as a powerful may, way of getting that message out because what we need to do is we need to be able to convince fellow Australians that this occurred to Australians and I find film is a very powerful way to create an emotional hook into the lives and the hearts of ordinary people and uh, that sort of storytelling, I think, can move a mass a position of empathy and understanding that this has happened to human beings. This has happened to original Australians. And what was the intent of bringing this sort of uh, mechanism into the destruction of Aboriginal people's lives and country? Yeah, no, I, I, I've been following some of the revelations that's come through some of the evidence that, um, you know, um, people under, undertaking this investigation have come to and it, what has really been quite an uh, eye-opener to me is that this was actual chemical warfare and that this chemical was used to destroy, purposefully destroy the lives of people and the fact that when it came here um, the way that it was um, distributed, uh, transported, used um, shows that to me that there must have been um, willful knowledge of what was going to occur to these Aboriginal men. The fact that they had no um, occupational health and safety training, the fact that um, the uh, batches that came were um, to some extent toxic and they needed to be diluted with diesel and all of those sorts of things. Um, the fact that they had no, um, no opportunity to uh, really understand the toxicity until they were personally impacted on. Um, it, it, it's, as I said, it's just criminal neglect and I, I find it quite shocking. I think one of the things in terms of this story is to be able to really um, understand that this chemical warfare to some extent was not just used on Aboriginal men. That um, from my understanding when the inquiry occurred I think back in 2004, they also revealed that batches of, um, you know, these sorts of chemicals were distributed to ordinary farmers um, in Western Australia, in Queensland and in, in the southern parts of Australia. So we really um, could be opening up the lid to understanding the destruction of lives to fellow Australians. So as I said, this has just given me an insight into one, what's happened immediately within my direct family, but as I see the stories and hear the stories unfolding, I'm absolutely um, aghast at the fact that so many Aboriginal people were involved um, and came into contact with this chemical. Mothers who washed the clothes, children who played in the water of where the men washed their cars when they came in. I think one of the other things that really made me quite um, nauseated was the fact that when these men were sent out to the river um, to spray uh, for weeks on end that they were supplied with alcohol so that they could just stay out there and wouldn't be distracted into coming into town. So as I said all of that sounds to me to some extent as if there was a lot of um, internal acts of 
people conspiring to get this act happening to Aboriginal men on country. And um, yeah, it's just been a total disaster. Yeah, no, there has, you know, from my understanding and looking at the whole storyline, I think, you know, one of the things that sticks into my mind is definitely intent. But how that was framed to actually occur in a real life situation on country. The way that um, the, from my understanding, some toxic batches of the materials were brought to the Kimberley, the way it was shipped up here, the way it was handled, um, the way it was stored, the way it was given to the men. And what is such a criminal um, act for me is that most of the men who joined the spraying group came because they believed and trusted the men that called on them. And it, that is possibly one of the most saddest things, you know, like you hear some of the stories of the men saying, oh, well, I was unemployed and I got this great opportunity to work and I took up the offer. And um, almost within the first 24 hours, those men were poisoned by using that material on, on their bodies and not having the safety equipment, not understanding occupational health and safety, not understanding, you know, that you needed to have uh, respiratory or um, equipment but also the time of the year in terms of when these sorts of things were being sprayed. So uh, I would almost go along to, um, uh, not I'll almost go along, I'm strongly convinced that this was to some extent a, a conspiracy against Aboriginal people. The intent of the whole process from when it was shipped in to when it actually got sprayed onto country and then the neglect that occurred when men started to demonstrate that they were having toxic uh, side effects from the spraying and you know going for ha ha hearing hearing their cries for help and how they would have fallen on deaf ears um, and that to some extent people didn't believe the toxicity that was occurring within their bodies and yet as I said we've had a whole group of young men who were dead by the time they were 30 and that that has a resounding impact in terms of the intergenerational clusters that I've witnessed in my lifetime over the next 30 years following the death of my brother and seeing the mutations and the painful way that people have basically had their lives taken from them in such a destructive and torturous way.